There we go. Yeah, so, so welcome. And th this morning we're going to look at Colossians 2, verses 6 to 15. And, and really the overall kind of title that, that I've put to this is that we're, we're living rooted, uh, rooted to Christ and that we're, we're called to be unswayed in any way by, by any distraction or any false gospel. Um, Trump um, has been a, a, an incredible one over these past four years to bring into the psyche of, of, of so many people this idea of um, uh, fake news, of, of things that are not actually true. Um, and in some respects today, and not, as, not that I'm a, a, in any way a supporter of Trump's values or principles, you know, we, we have to be very careful about um, what, is, what is true and, and therefore, you know, God's word is where we, we will find truth. Um, so just a little recap on last week. Last week, you remember, we, we considered the mystery of God um, as we looked at, at the earlier verses. Um, and we were reminded of the hope that is found in, that, in the gospel message through Jesus. And that through him, we've been given an understanding of the mystery of God, that we can put our trust in him, that he lives in every believer. I think that's been the real thing that's come out for me, that he's living in us um, and that we can embrace the challenge that Paul gives us and to the Colossians to pursue that maturity in our, in our relationship. Um, we can begin to internalize the truth that Jesus is in us. We don't have to strive to earn salvation uh, or God's approval. Instead, we obey from a place of love and this deep desire for an intimate relationship with him. Um, and then you, you may remember we took away some actions from that. And, and each week I'm encouraging you to, to encourage us all to, to take a, a bit of time afterwards if we can five ten minutes just reflect on what the study has been uh, today and consider maybe what we're we're gonna we're gonna do into today and um, also just to be aware for for everyone that all of the notes all my transcripts go up online onto the the website i hope you're finding that useful um and the the video of this goes up as well so that you can you can watch yourself again and see if you look pretty on screen and um, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and reflect back on on some of the the stuff that we've that we've covered, and then at the very end, what we'll have is this kind of kind of live it out section where we don't just we just don't hear God's word, but we take something from that into the week ahead um, as, as part of our our growth and, and our our maturity. Um, there's a dog who wants out to the door. Just give me one sec. <laughs> Um, anyway, it's a way to get his water. Um, okay, so today we're going to consider that as Jesus has brought, brought us from death to life and he's triumphed over every authority, we said that, he, that, that he's Lord of all, that we can live rooted in him and we're not to be swayed um, by any false gospel. And obviously the, Col the Colossians as a, as a group of believers who were people that Paul didn't know, but he was very conscious of the influences that were, that were coming in. That was that sense of, you know, is Jesus sufficient? Is that all? Is that all that is required? And so today um, we're going we're gonna to think about how this word is going to change what we think about Jesus. We're going to think about how it changes our heart and then how it affects us as we, we kind of go out. So in terms of what it's going to do, I think this morning in terms of our head is that we, we know we've been brought from death to life by the power of Jesus and we can live a life that reflects his authority. That's, that's kind of where, where we want to go. In terms of what that means in terms of our hearts, that we feel confident in the truth of the gospel um, so that we can stand that place of rootedness, that being firm in Christ without being persuaded by other things. And then uh, in terms of our lives, 
that we live a life that reflects the new, that new life that we've been given in Christ so that we have a strong foundation. And in particular in these times, um, that, that as people look upon the church, that they see it as a strong and, and, and firm foundation that's built on nothing but, but, but Jesus. Okay, so here's talking about a complete 180 degree turn from even that introduction. I want you to have a think about your favorite adverts. I want you to think about adverts on TV, um, commercials on TV, um, and whether or not a commercial makes, uh, makes, makes their case strong enough and it's compelling enough that it, that it does something, it changes something about you, maybe makes you decide to buy something. Now, I was, th- I was obviously, I had time to prepare for this. So I want to show you an advert that definitely um, has um, uh, stuck by me um, through my life. I can't even, I can date it. It's whenever I was 10, 10 years of age. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you here. Um, and I want you to, um, I want you to watch this advert. So hopefully you can see a screen now. So, so watch this wee advert. Stale smells up here often come from down there in your carpet. Smells from your dog and tobacco too. Well, shake and back from Gladys here. It's all you have to do. Do the shake and back and put the freshness back. Do the shake and back and put the freshness back. When your carpet's now fresh, you're on the Every time you vacuum, remember what to do. Do the shake and back and put the freshness back. Shake and back now in three fragrances. So, who remembers that? Oh, yeah. 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 You can you can all you can almost um, you can almost sing the tune through. And when it, whenever I saw the um, whenever I saw the bottle at the end of it, stale smells up here. Often come from down there. In your it again. Well, shaken back from ladies here. <laughs> so it's going to play it again for me. Sorry. Um, whenever I whenever I saw the the, the bottle thing, I thought. Yeah, we went out and bought those. We went, we we had them in the house and we used to flick it and, and smell around the carpet and all. I, you know, um, so that that kind of convinced us, a family, that we need to have shake and vac. Are there any other adverts or anything that you can think off the top of your head that kind of stuck stuck in your mind and um, you know affected you in any way? Well, there's one I love. And that's go compare. I love the fellow who sings. I laugh, and I I think he's a brilliant singer for a start, which appeals to me. And I think it catches your attention. And he is such a personality too; you can't resist listen to what he has to say. And George, do you feel as though that you've been persuaded to go onto the Go Compare website? Not that we're going to advertise these today, but that, that you, you've been persuaded to go onto the Go Compare uh, website whenever you've needed to get pricing comparisons? Well, to be honest, not, not really. I, I love it for its entertainment value rather than for the end result. Okay. And anybody else? Any, any, any adverts? I love the one with um, the two two men in the car and they're eating the chewy sweets and they're speaking like oh, children. Horrible. Uh, Harry, uh, Harry. Because it reminds me of a lady and that I would buy um, chewy sweets like those at Christmas time and birthdays. So, so do you, it obviously reminds me of her. Do you have any Haribos in the house now? No, I don't like chewy sweets. It's big bars of chocolate I like. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it, do you know something? The reason I'm putting that in is that it, it, it's sometimes very easy to pers- be persuaded um, to do something or to change something or to buy something. And advertisers, you know, they, they bank on that happening through their, ad- their advertisements. Do you know that in the UK, now obviously this is, these figures are pre-COVID, so I don't know how it's going to be affected. But the UK advertising market is projected to cost twenty-four billion pounds in creating adverts in twenty twenty-one. That's how much money 
companies are willing to put in to advertise their products and they're convinced that it's going to influence um, the general public, which is an astonishing amount of money. Um, and so today, as we look at this passage of scripture in, uh, in Colossians, Paul is cautioning the church to not be influenced by false teaching. You know, so we, we've watched the adverts for, um, uh, for various, um, I think this was in the past, whenever there was uh, clothes, uh, washing up powders and stuff like that. And they kind of convinced, you know, that it would make your, your, your whites whiter than white. Um, and who believes that? And so we've got to discern today when it comes to what's influencing us, not necessarily adverts, but, but what's influencing us that we're not led astray. So we're going to read um, Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 6 through to 15. 6 through to 15. Does anybody want to read that for me? Uh, do you want me to read down till 10 and somebody else take over? Um, or do you just want me to go ahead? Yeah, just, just read, read it all, Winnie, sure. That's all right. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to live in obedience to him. Let your roots grow down into him and draw up nourishment from him, so you will grow in faith, strong and vigorous in the truth you were taught. Let your lives overflow with thanksgiving for all he has done. Don't let anyone lead you astray with empty philosophy and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the evil powers of this world, and not from Christ. For in Christ the fullness of God lives in a human body, and you are complete through your union with Christ. He is the Lord over every ruler and authority in the universe. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. It was a spiritual procedure, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to a new life, because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all your sins. He cancelled the record that contained the charges against us. He took it and destroyed it by nailing it to the cross. In this way, God disarmed the evil rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross of Christ. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. You can stop, you can stop there, Winnie. Just I'm sorry, up, I was up, 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 No, up to 15, that's fine. Thank you. Um, do you know something? Those verses, I think every day, uh, every single person needs to, um, to read those. I, I, I just find them just astonishing words just to remind us of, of what our faith it, it is, is all about and that fullness that we have in Christ. So we're going we're gonna to watch um, the video here. It, it's, it's reasonably short. It's only about, it's about 10 minutes. Um, and it's it's going to pick up on um, four particular things that, that, that Louis is going to pick up on, um, which will become clear once you, you watch this. So let me let me just share uh, my screen again for you, if I can find it. Um, yeah, okay. Let me share that. All right. Is that, can you see a video now? Yeah. Oh, yes. Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Super. Okay, well, let's just watch this. You know, we talked early on about how that moment that we put our faith in Jesus, everything changed. Remember how we were transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the son that he loved, into Jesus, where we got redemption and the forgiveness of our sins in an act of faith everything about us changed. But now that the tables are turning a little bit and God's wanting us to see if that's real, if all that's a reality about you and me in Christ right now, then what does it look like when we walk that out? 
and we live that out in our day-to-day -day life. And we're starting to see that now in this section that we're walking through today, especially around four words that uh, fortunately for us all start with F. And they are these. There's follow-up. There's a foundation. We're going to see the fullness that God wants us to discover. And there's a finished work in this text today. So let's start with the first one, the follow-up. And I love this verse. I want to read it for us out of the text. It says, so then, this is verse 6, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. I remember the, the first time I think God really helped me understand that text because like a lot of us, I had this idea that Jesus did all the work to get me into heaven, but then I had to do all the work from there. He came all the way from heaven to earth, died on a cross, went into my grave, was raised up by the power of God, and then said, okay, great, you're forgiven, and you're son of God, and you've got a place in heaven. Now you've got to figure it out from here, and you've got to come up with the resources to live a different kind of life. But this is amazing for us today. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him or to live in him. And so how did Paul tell us in Ephesians that we received Christ Jesus as Lord? He said, we received him by grace, right? Through faith, not a, as a result of works so that none of us could boast. So if we didn't get Christ by works that we could boast about, we're not going to walk in Christ by works that we can boast about. We walk in him today the same way we received him on that first day, and that is by grace through faith. Now, there is a walking involved in it, and we're going to see that in the text. There is a living and an obedience and a following of Jesus, but the power is not us. The power is Christ in us, that passage we just looked at at the end of chapter 1. And so I just want to encourage you today, when you wake up in the morning, it's not okay God, you did all the work to get me here. I got to go today and do all the work to make it happen. We can't, we don't have the power in and of ourselves to follow through on this brand new life. And we don't have to because Christ is offering you the grace you need today to follow and obey him in everything he's calling you to do. And so as we're obeying, as we're following, we just continue to say to him, God, give me the grace and give me the faith to believe that in me, you're going to supply the power that I need to be the person you want me to be. And that happens, it says in the next line, when we're rooted in him. So it's not about what's above the surface. That's the Instagram culture we live in. Here's my best life on the best day with the best filter. That's not really what spiritual growth and maturity looks like. Spiritual growth and maturity looks like what's under the surface. It's that hidden walk, that hidden time in the word. It's what we're doing right now. It's putting roots down deep into the person of Christ, the work of God, the love of God, so that up from those roots comes that sustaining grace, that sustaining life of Jesus that powers us through every day. That's the follow through of what happens after you make the decision. I want to put my faith and I want to put my trust in Jesus. The second word is foundation. And this word brings us back to the purpose of the letter and why Paul wrote it in the first place. And that was that there was some false teaching working its way into this new group of believers in Jesus in Colossae. And he takes it head on in these next few lines. And he says, don't let anybody take you away from the simplicity of the message of Jesus. And I want you to notice something, because I think this is essential for all of us in the church, I mean, the big C church of Jesus Christ around the world. It's pretty amazing the way he summarizes it. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. Now, remember the problem of the day was people thought there was a secret knowledge, a, a higher way of knowing things, a little secret group of people who had inside track on spiritual mysteries and understanding. And Paul's saying, no, we all have access to the fullness of who God is in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the same for every one of us. And it doesn't come because you have the secret code to the door. It comes because Christ, as we're going to see in the next few verses, is the fullness of God. And when we have him, we have access to the fullness of God in our lives. But there's always going to be somebody that says, yeah, but have you heard about so-and-so? Did you read about such and such? Have you seen this new book that's unfolding this new mystery, this new idea, this new level of understanding? 
And here's the thing that we always want to do. We always want to be careful that wherever the conversation goes, it always comes back to the foundation of Christ. And that's what he says. He says, don't let him take you away with hollow and deceptive philosophy. He said, instead, always build on Christ. And so I just want to encourage us to make sure that at the end of every conversation, the end of everything we're reading, the newest thing, the newest idea that we're able to say, but is that firmly rooted on the person of Jesus? And that's how we make sure our foundation stays strong. And it's how we make sure that we don't end up in the same boat as the people in Colossae could have, where somebody comes into the circle and says, hey, I've got a great new idea. Uh, Something's been revealed to me, and I'm going to share it with everyone else. I'm like, great, go ahead. But it better land on Jesus. It better be founded on Jesus. And all of its substance must bring us back to Jesus at the end of the day. The third word is fullness. And by that word, God is wanting you and I to understand who Christ is and what we have in him. You see that theme again, right? All the way through this letter. This is the way Paul writes it. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So that's that miracle of the incarnation. Jesus isn't just a part of God. It's God in a human body, in the person of Christ. All that fullness of God, all the fullness of the deity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all residing in Christ. But listen to the next part. He says, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. You know what that means today? It means that you and I have everything we need in Christ to do everything God has called us to do. We're not just nobodies in the kingdom of God. It's not like we're beggars looking for scraps to fall off the table of heaven, or we're just a sinner saved by grace. I hear people say that all the time. It sounds great. sounds humble. sounds like, you know, I'm, I'm putting myself in my right place, but we're not just sinners saved by grace. We are sinners who've been brought from death to life in the power of Jesus Christ and been given in Christ access to the fullness of God. So God wants you to start your day, to walk into circumstances and situations, not feeling like you're at the back, but feeling like I have access to the fullness of God in Christ. I have a power source in me right now. And he gives us a picture of that. He says, it's the same as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you put your faith in Jesus, it's as if the old you passed away and a brand new you has come to life. I love that we're sitting in this environment right now. This is exactly the picture of what Paul's talking about right here. When Christ went into the grave, he's saying, you went into it with him. All the power that was over you in your old way of life went down into that grave with him. But when he came out of the grave, the same power that brought him out of the grave brought you out of the grave too. The same power that raised up Christ has raised up us. So we have access today to supernatural power, supernatural life. Where? Some secret you know, code that you have to figure out? No, in the person of Jesus Christ. And in the last of these words that all begin with F is finished work. And he just leads us now to the grand conclusion of our story. And I pray somehow today, just in the reading of this word, that God will give every one of us the ability to say, I agree with that. You know what he says? He says it like this. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulation that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a spectacle of them triumphing over them through the cross. So that's a mouthful, I know, but wow, what does that mean? It simply means that God took everything written against us, all of the debt we owed, all of the wrath that we were due, took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross in and through the person of Jesus Christ. And it's canceled, it's finished, it's done. That's where it is today. He helps us understand the gospel in the clearest terms. He says, when you were dead, Christ made you alive. Isn't that awesome? 
I think sometimes I get in conversations with people and they really quickly want to get around, uh, you know, the value of, of their behavior. They're like, oh, you're a pastor. Great. Well, da, 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 da. And if we end up talking about faith, they're like, well, I don't, I don't think I'm a bad person. Well, none of us really think deep down that we're all that bad of a person. But what Paul's helping us understand is that, that the gospel isn't that sin makes you bad. And Christ came and he wants to improve things a little bit. The gospel story is way worse than that. The gospel story is that sin makes us spiritually dead. And do you know what? Dead people can't do one thing to help themselves. Christ didn't come to just improve you and me. Christ came because he had the power to bring us from death back to everlasting life. So what's our response to that? Our response is to look up and see what God has done and to say, I agree with that. So many times we're wrestling with the reality of something Jesus has completely finished on our behalf. Oh, I don't think I could accept it. I could never forgive myself. I could never really feel like I'm going to get another chance with God. I don't know if I really qualified for that complete freedom that comes in what Jesus did. Listen, what honors God is when we agree with God. So look up at that work today and say, I see it canceled, finished, paid in full. I will not carry this guilt one more day. I will not carry this shame one more inch in my life because that doesn't honor a God who said it's finished, it's canceled, it's done. That's my statement to the world and that's my statement about who you are. Let's celebrate today and let's agree today with the finished work of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, so he, he is, he's always very, I think, very encouraging. Um, you, I always feel very lifted by him. So there was four things that, that, that came out of that today, which was, um, first to explore further is the follow-up, the foundation, the fullness and the finished work. And we're going to be able to see each of these as we go through the reading again. So let's take the first section, which is, Second uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. I'll just read it from my translation. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Okay, so Paul's urging the Colossians to live their lives in Jesus. He uses that phrase, he actually uses it often in, in, in scripture. He uses it in Galatians, he uses it in Romans, he uses it in 2 Corinthians um, to continue to, to get us to continue to walk in our faith. Um, I, it's that follow up stage. It, it's not just holding on to, you know, I can remember back to the Dick Saunders campaign at the age of eight in the Wallace Park. And being given the wee blue card that said I'd given my life to Christ. You know, that, that was a point in time. But my life, my life changed at that point. And what it's about now is it's about the continual follow-up and walking that new life each and every day. It's not about just saying, oh, well, you know, I was confirmed whenever I was 13. And, that, and, that, and, and in some way that that is that, that is, that's the marker, um, and that's all, all, all that counts. Um, we can't sit, I think I might have said this last week, we can't settle back, kind of put our arms back and say, well, it's, it's fine, you know, I was, I was baptized whenever I was six, six weeks old, and that's, that's it, that's it, that's it done. We have to live each and every day, living our lives in Jesus. We continue to keep in step with Jesus, after choosing to follow him, after we've made that choice, then we walk every day all by his grace and it's through faith. So last week we talked, here's a question. Last week we talked about building a spiritual maturity. And today we're talking about living lives in step with Jesus. So what, what does that look like on a daily basis in yours and my actions and thoughts? What, what does living our lives in Jesus look like every day? Um, I suppose let's, 
let's think more practically about what that looks like rather than I suppose the textbook answer that sometimes comes. And therefore, whenever we think about that, what, what can cause that then to slip? What can cause our daily walk to slip? Sometimes our selfish needs, uh, we may try and think we're doing the walk with Jesus, but an occasion may come up where a choice needs to be made, and that choice possibly is dictated by your own desires, and therefore maybe a bit of weakness. You, you go and then think later on, oh, maybe that wasn't what I should have done. I, I shouldn't have did that thing or went out to see that person or watch that movie because I knew in my own heart that it probably wasn't the movie or the person to see uh, and then feel guilty in that respect but at least I know that the guilt I feel from possibly making that decision, that wrong decision not walking completely with Jesus uh, is a sign that Jesus is still in me uh, pointing towards my mistakes and hopefully I can correct them mm -hmm. Yeah well, I, I'm a, an avid snooker fan, and sometimes earlier in the day, I look to see what's on uh, the television so as I can record it and not uh, just watch the commercials in between. <laughs> but then at the end of the day, I think, what have I done with myself today? I've been hours glued to the screen. You know, how much time did I give to God? And I do feel a bit guilty about it. You know, I think I could have been doing far more fruitful things. And then I'd say, oh, I haven't wronged so-and-so for a long time, a friend of mine somewhere. And then, uh, oh, I'll do such and such a thing first. And then by the time I've done that, I remember something else. And then, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. You know, it's decisions and how, how you use your time, really. I think I think it's it's it, I think all of us probably would agree that it's such a it's such a fine line because you know in, in the midst of it all that feeling of guilt that kicks in is 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 Satan kind of taking what you're trying to be as a person living in Christ and that constant knock of feeling oh you're a failure you've you've wasted your day because you've sat and done this um, and and I, I suppose. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm open for discussion on this really this morning, but you know, uh, you, for example, I'll, I'll take the dog out for a walk after this because he hasn't been for a walk yet, okay? And, and he, he definitely deserves a walk to th this morning. Um, cause someone, one of the bishops, I was on a um, uh, Zoom the other day and the bishop basically said, that's a fat dog you've got. Poor <laughs> 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 spud. Um, but, but, you know, I could sit and then think to myself, I just went out for a walk for half an hour and I, and I, could, have been, I could have been using that time better. Although whenever I'm out, I may be talking to God. And, and it's, it's a very fine line, I think, but think, but, you know, of thinking, you know, I'm, I've just not, I've not lived my life in Christ in, in this very moment because I've, I've used it in some kind of selfish means to relax or whatever, you know, so to... It's a real fine line. Does anybody else feel that? Yeah, yeah, yeah especially, yeah. Go ahead, Sophie. Especially, there's so much busyness in our lives. And I think we get a bit carried away. If I go right back, I was um, confirmed when I was 14. And I was, you know, I was serious about it. Uh, because I had been helping with a wee Sunday school class and all the rest of it. And I had determined that I was going to live a good Christian life and follow the examples of the Christians in the church. And I started to do that. And I always went to Christian Endeavour. And when I wanted at that point then to become an active member, was sort of the, up a bit from the associate. And I can remember when I said to a couple of old, more mature Christians who then came to say, that's lovely, you know, we pray over you. And it was only when they began to pray over me that I really felt guilt because I felt, I knew at that point that up to then all my Christian, as I thought, busyness was coming from me. It wasn't rooted in the Lord. And it was then, and I really did feel quite guilty about it. And down the years on different things, there are times that I've done things which are good 
in the ordinary sense of the thing, but they're maybe not what God wants you to do. And then I remember at the end of it all that God loves me, mm. that God saved me because he loves me. Yeah. And he knows that I am not perfect, but he still loves me. And that I can take great comfort from that and know that even if I did something that maybe, maybe I wasn't as obedient as I might have been, I can repent of it, I can regret it, and I can sit down with the Lord and talk to him and know, still know that I'm loved. And I think that's the, the basis of it. And then that I can listen and I can go out and I can do the things that he really wants me to do. I can love others the way that he, he loves me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so let, let's, let's move on a wee bit more then. Um, verse 7 talks about being rooted uh, and being built up um, in, in him. Um, uh, the, the, the hidden things that we do are, are what mature us as followers. You know, yes, it, it, it's, it's the things that are, it's not the things that we're, you know, kind of making a big deal of. Look, and, look at me and whatever. It's, it's what we're doing in our own private lives as we desire to kind of, what I keep saying about going deeper um, in our relationship with God. And as we are built up in our faith, Paul also says at the end of this, uh, verse 7, that he says that we give thanks. So why is it important to walk our lives rooted in Christ, but in thanksgiving? Why is it important as we, we live our lives um, rooted in him, established in the faith, but that we're, we're abounding in thank, thanksgiving? Why, why is the, the thanksgiving important? Well, if you go back to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, yeah. uh, you know, it's by grace we are saved through yep. faith, mm -hmm. not that of ourselves, it is a gift of God, and not of works lest any man should boast. I think that maybe answers that one, that we're dependent on God for absolutely everything. And even though we can achieve this, that, and the other, it's by the grace of God he gives us the power to do it, even to get up in the morning. Every time I get up in the morning, uh, I, I draw back the blinds. And every time I up, draw black, uh, each blind, I thank God for some different thing. Usually started off for thanking him for another day and for keeping me safe throughout the night. Because we're dependent on him for absolutely everything, even the breath we draw. Yeah, and, and even just at the beginning, just to have taken that moment to pray that, to pray, you know, that our, our hearts have beaded, the, the, our, our bodies have pumped blood right throughout the night, and we're so dependent on God and so much. And, and so, 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 yes, it, we, uh, we do, we come from that place. Uh, we should come from that place of thanksgiving. Um, let's read uh, verse 8. It says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on, on Christ. Um, yeah, so um, we've, we've discussed in this study that Colossians were being led astray. We, 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 we've kind of got that. And, he, and Paul calls it hollow and deceptive philosophy. Paul was concerned that they were being wrongly influenced, that there was a, a kind of secret insider way to get more access to God. And Paul wrote to remind the Colossians that their foundation would only be found in Jesus and his gospel, not in some kind of secret, uh, secret answer or, or society. Now, it just some, you know, I, I like to kind of dip, dip and dabble into the, the Greek a little bit. If we were to read this verse in the Greek, um, verse 8, we would find out that Paul is trying to actually introduce a little pun um, here in these words, he says, take care that nobody uh, takes you captive. Okay. But that phrase, take captive, um, I'll not pronounce this right, but it comes from a, a Greek word called selagogon. Okay. And it's very close to the Greek word for synagogue. Okay. Um, and so why, why would he need to do this? Why would he play around these words? Well, if you consider his writing to the Galatians, he's, con he's really concerned um, that the Jewish zealots um, had told the, the new converts that in becoming Christians, that they were kind of almost only half there, 
that they needed more, that they, they now needed to complete that through circumcision and through keeping to the, the law of Moses, to the Torah. And Paul had argued that this was a, a misunderstanding they, now in, in Christ, that they would be buying into a system which wouldn't do them any, any more good than some kind of pagan practice. And, and Colossae wasn't actually distance-wise too far away from physically from uh, Galatia. And most towns would have had synagogues or areas would have had synagogues. And Paul was worried that they would fall captive to influences that would suggest that their newfound faith wasn't actually enough. It was empty deceit built on tradition. So the, so the word synagogue and captive, um, the you know, NT right would suggest that that, that Paul is not being accidental in any way with how he's using those words as if to say, yeah, what I mean is, you know, don't get into this, this practice stuff that, that they're suggesting. Everything must be aligned to Jesus and him alone. Whatever new idea might come forward, the acid test, I think Louis brought this out, has to be this. Everything we do, does it have Jesus as Lord at the center and at the focus because if it doesn't then it should ring it should ring little little bells and the video today encouraged us to filter everything we hear and read outside of scripture with jesus so we 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 every time we're we're reading something or we're, we're hearing something we go back to scripture we go back to you know what what does scripture tell us? Does, um, you know, does this idea that we've got this idea that's coming into someone's head, or maybe it's some new law coming in from, um, uh, from government or whatever it might be, is there a foundation of it in, in God's word? Whenever we encounter ideas that are contrary to the gospel, we can turn to faith and we can turn to the truth rather than going astray. So um, the next section of scripture explains why this is possible. So the, the first section ties actually into the, the, this, this uh, third word, which Louis used, which was fullness. So again, let me read verses um, 9 and 10. Sorry, before we go on there, could I just share something with you? Go ahead. In the history of Colossae, uh, long before Paul came there, the, that city was a very, very important, a very rich and prosperous place. And the Colossians, as Paul found out, were living on uh, previous uh, riches and reputations, but they had long since dropped away and the place had, it was like wreck and ruin. Yeah. And uh, it reminds me, you know, um, an old saying I once heard, never pin your faith on another man's sleeve. And that's what they were doing. They were living on past rec reputations and, and grandeur, which really had no effect or no impact on, on the day yeah. that he came there. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for that. So, um, and we're going we're gonna to see how Paul then kind of cements this um, further um, in these next uh, verses that he wants to emphasize. So verse 9 and 10. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. That You couldn't, you couldn't be any more clear what he's saying there. And we've already talked about Jesus' divinity back in chapter 1. And so if Jesus is Lord then why would anything else be actually required? And the thing is, if Jesus isn't fully God, then he doesn't have the power to save us. So he had to be both fully God and fully human in order to redeem us through his sacrifice. So if you're talking to someone and you ask them the question, you know, who is Jesus? And, and, and typically they'll start off with, you know, he was a, he was a man, um, and I, yeah, well, I understand that, I get that. But what Paul is making absolutely clear here is that Christ is all the fullness of the deity. He is everything uh, of, of what, is, what is God. Um, 
Uh, and through Jesus, fully God, fully man, we find salvation from sin and death. And we've been filled by him. And in him, we experience the full and complete salvation of God. So why do you think we're sometimes tempted to think or act as though our salvation isn't enough? So if, if Paul is saying everything is in Jesus, why, why do we sometimes be tempted to think or act as though it, you know, it, it, it isn't enough? You know, even picking up on what Sophie said earlier about the busyness, the, and that's a, that is a sin, it's the sin of busyness that can creep in and, and take away from the sufficiency that we, we simply need of Christ. So what, why do you think we're sometimes tempted to think or act as though salvation isn't enough? Well, going back to Adam in the Garden of Eden, uh, his great sin was really, uh, he wanted to be uh, to this, this tree of knowledge. He, he wanted a certain amount of independence mm -hmm. and he wanted to justify himself. And I think that's inherent in all human people mm -hmm. that we want, uh, we want to do it God's way, but we want to, we feel, oh, you know, but I, I can do this and I can do that and I can do the other. And if we go on our own strength, well, we're, we're on a hiding to nothing, you know. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. It's a kind of, uh, yet not your will, Lord, but mine alone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, oh, almost the other way around. So, so here the Colossians were being influenced by two things. Um, we might run over a wee bit because of this, but it, I think it's important to pick up on it. First one was, was circumcision, and the, the second thing was the law of Moses. And these are the two things that the, the Jewish zealots were, were also pushing for uh, you know in Galatia, um, so let me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna read to you um, from Genesis um, chapter seventeen, and these are in my notes as well. Genesis chapter seventeen, verses nine through to fourteen. Um, God said to Abraham, "As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations." This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you shall be circumcised when he is eight days old, including the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money from any, uh, from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Both the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money must be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh um, it, of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So you can see that this covenant that has followed these people throughout the generations is an important one. It is an external sign of what they were part of as a covenant um, people. Okay, so we, we know that. But let me just turn then to what Paul then says in Romans, in Romans chapter 2. And it's Romans chapter 2, verses 25 to 29. Romans 2, 25 to 29. 25 to 25, yeah. Circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. So that's circumcision and then the, the Torah, the two things that have been talked about here. But if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if those who are uncircumcised keep the requirements of the law, will not their uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then those who are physically uncircumcised but keep the law will condemn you that have the written code and circumcision, but break the law. Um, for a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, 
nor is true circumcision something external and physical. Just pick up on that. Nor is true circumcision something external and physical. Rather, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart. It is spiritual and not literal. Such a person receives praise not from others, but from God. So, to have um, Paul, Paul here then, if we now move quickly to Colossians, to what Paul says in these verses, he says in verse 11 and 12, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. So it's not the old, the old covenant. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So to have a heart circumcised by God means to have a heart that is surrendered and obedient and glorifying to God. Whenever Paul talks about Jesus circumcising our hearts, he's using that imagery of the, the Jewish people that they they recognize and he's trying to explain it not as physical but as a spiritual thing so through Jesus we can now enjoy being his covenant people because he's obviously made the way for us and these verses show how God is the one who secured our salvation through his actions alone we cannot add to it Paul so and so Paul's using circumcision to explain that point Circumcision was that external sign of the covenant. Um, but the circumcision that Paul is now talking about is not physical, it's spiritual. Our flesh, which used to rule us, has been taken off by Jesus. And the true circumcision that Paul is declaring isn't what people do physically to the male body. It's what happens whenever you're buried with Christ and you're raised with him through God's power. Okay? Paul uses a word here in verse 11 to describe spiritual circumcision. It doesn't come from human hands. It's done by what God has done in us. It's the salvation that we receive in Jesus that hasn't come from human hands. Okay. Um, so whenever we decide to follow Jesus, our old selves die with him. We're raised to new life. And Paul is clear that it's the power of God that both raised Jesus from the dead and brought us back to life again. Can you see even just in those words that he's written, can you imagine the uproar that that would have had culturally? You are, you're, you're stating something, um, and he's saying it from a, from a prison as well. He's saying it from, from chains. He's, He's emphasizing the point, and he knows fine well that there are authorities around him that are ready to kill him, ready to get rid of him, and yet he keeps trying to get the message out there to these new churches to say, don't, 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 get, don't get misled by this. This is, this is why Jesus has come. This is, this is the, new, the new covenant. But can you see how that would have been such a, a major change culturally yes yeah, yeah. significant you know the baptists when they baptize people it's total immersion yeah and the reason they say they do that is when they immerse the person it's dying to sin yeah and when they rise up from there they're born again it's it's like uh, in place of circumcision really yeah. You know, that, that they're uh, died to sin and then they're raised uh, in Christ, you know. Yeah. I, th I, think, I, th I think at some stage I, I would like to, um, but I would need to do a lot of work on it. I, I would like us to examine, as a church, I'd like us to examine the whole issue of baptism um, in, in, in that context. Um, because, as I'm sure you, you know well from me, my, my reading of, of, of that sense of dying, to sin and raising to life in Jesus. You know, it, I, I cannot in my head work out how infant baptism 
uh, allow allows for that. I just I just can't. I as I read scripture, I simply cannot I cannot see that. Um, but I'm I'm very conscious it's very much part and parcel of a of a tradition that's gone well before me and probably something that that we're not going to be able to cover today. Um, so look, look, let's look at the final point just as we, we kind of come to an end. Let's read verses 13 through to uh, 15. Um, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So not only does Jesus bring us new life, but he also, also brings us forgiveness of our sins. Without Jesus, Paul says that we're indebted to God because, because of sin. You know, we're, we're guilty. We're guilty as charged. And verse 14 explains that God cancels our debt by nailing it to the cross. And it's through the death of Jesus we've been given and, and his, his, his death and resurrection, we've been given new life. We're no longer ruled by the flesh. We're free from guilt. Our salvation is this finished work. Jesus did everything necessary to save us. And um, through Jesus' death, we've been given that, 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 that life, and we, but we still feel the tension because we live in a fallen world, don't we? Jesus yeah. ha hasn't yet returned to restore all things. But in the meantime, what Paul is trying to say here from the very start is live your lives in Jesus. So, yes, we live in this broken tension um, where we live in this fallen world, but we, we've got to walk faithfully and follow him. So this final verse, verse 15, tells us that in addition to all these things, Jesus has disarmed the spiritual authorities that once ruled. And when Paul says that he's made, Jesus has made a spectacle, a public spectacle of them, he's actually painting a picture here of Roman practice. Can you remember that whenever Jesus was brought, uh, brought uh, to, to, to trial, one of the things that happened to him was that he was mocked at, he was spat, spat at, um, a crown of thorns was placed on his head and, 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 a, and, a, and a robe was placed out in mockery. And that would have been something that the Romans would have, they would have, they would have done that regularly whenever they captured enemies. They would have paraded them around and they would have made them to look foolish. And so whenever Paul talks here in this verse about, um, you know, about Jesus making a, a public spectacle of any, of any spiritual authority, he, he again, Paul's, Paul's not being accidental about the use of his language. He's chained, he's, he's chained in, 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 uh, in captivity at that moment himself. And yet he understands and is making the point that irrespective of the chains, irrespective of all that's going ahead uh, against him, the ultimate victory comes um, from the risen Lord Jesus. So just one final question to ask. How can that perspective that Paul paints here, how can that shape your view of your, well, even your current circumstances or circumstances that you might go through? Well, sometimes, you know, it's better to have what appears defeat and stand to your principles and what is right rather than victory as other people see it. You know, he, he actually turned defeat into victory. He triumphed over sin through the cross and that was the only way he could do it by paying the ultimate penalty. He had to go through that. He knew that and that's why his father sent him there, even his own son. You know, that, that was... In the eyes of human beings, uh, that spectacle was defeat and, and the end. Even the, even the disciples deserted him. Yeah. But that was actually actual in, in the long term when he rose again. That was victory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so if, you, if, if we take just a moment to think about our world today, 
think about our society, think about the community in which we live, think about the government and what they are doing or what they have done or what they, they possibly will do. Um, I think it's really important that we consider or we become aware of the influences that pull on people and we can call them authorities. We can call them different types of anything that has any kind of control is an authority. But Paul is saying here, you know, that that might be the case, but actually Jesus makes a spectacle of, of anything that tries to influence um, in, in, in a wrong sense. But it, I suppose what I'd like you to consider as you go into the into the day and into the into the week ahead is what are those things that are the influences that pull on people? What are those attractions that may likely draw new Christians um, away from the fulfillment that Paul is 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 saying that they have in Jesus and Jesus alone? And there's all you know, there's all kinds. Uh, kinds of things um, at a at a wider Anglican level um, there is the influence of of this the deception of this word love and that in order to love um, we 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 yes we we um, receive everyone in but that in some way the deceit is that we are to accept everybody with whatever the practices are that they that they carry out, and that that we are um, to almost just receive them uh, as is, um, and that that as a church we are to accommodate um, and and be swayed by those influences. And I think that's a very in the, in the Anglican Communion that's a very dangerous uh, route to take down. So, or to go down. Um, so just to finish off, whenever we read ourselves in Jesus and in this gospel, we're able to discern when people or authorities will try to deceive us. That's what we've said. And we've said that Jesus will overthrow those powers. He's triumphed over everything through the cross. We've received the fullness of salvation through his finished work and nothing can undo the work that Jesus has done for us. Um, so into the week ahead, let's ask God to deepen our own roots and as we, we, we kind of close, just in our minds, as we go into maybe a wee bit of time to think through this morning, thank him for what he's done for us. Um, just some practical points, which will be on your notes for, for living it out. There, there's five different things. First of all, pray. Pray God would, would deepen your foundation in him. Um, and I, I think that's something that I need, that, that each and every day, there's that rootedness that everything comes from him. Um, Secondly, it is that verse seven where it talks about uh, giving thanks and um, maybe write down uh, for every day in this week things to be thankful for and to praise God and how uh, he, he, he's worked in you and um, in your life. Um, a bigger one, a bigger study is to go through Ro uh, Romans and verse or chapters 1 to 8. That's a lot to cover. Um, but what you're going to find whenever you read Romans 1 through 8, if you, you haven't done that, I'm, I'm sure you've all read the, those portions. Um, you read about the power of the gospel. You're going to see about the righteousness coming through faith in Jesus. Um, you're going to learn about justification by faith. You're going to learn about being released from the law and living life free. Um, you're going to learn that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So that's, you can look through that. Um, the next one is a create one. And as I've said before, I'm not really one for um, creating things. Um, but if you're a creative person, you can make something or, or do something that reminds you of the truth that's come from being, um, being brought from death to life. Um, and then the final one, which I definitely will do, and I think if, if you can write it out and put it somewhere that's close to you, that you can see every day, maybe whenever you wake in, um, memorize um, uh, Colossians 2, um, 6, 6 to 7. Um, I think they are incredible words. As you root, therefore have received Christ Jesus as your Lord, 
continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. So uh, have that somewhere to encourage you each day. Um, any, any final thoughts? I'm conscious that, that I've been chatting a lot today rather than listening. So um, any final thoughts before we pray? Um, <coughs> yep. The fact that you were talking about the ads and the television, um, that changes people's minds about it. all those things about sexual behaviour and greed. It it has just come slowly into everything that's on the television without some people even noticing. Yeah, and that comes in from whoever has the power over. Yeah, TV. It's it, it's it's very it's very. It's well, yeah. I, I can't understand why the authorities allow uh, some ads on, especially about gambling, and they make it so attractive, and then they offer loans at 100%. That's absolutely sinful. I've worked in a bank all my life, and the highest I ever remember, and people moaned and groaned about it, was 16%, and that was only for somebody who was a terribly bad risk. But 100%. That's criminal. I'll, I'll scare you, George. I'll, I'll really scare you because on daytime TV, um, you'll actually see 1,200% on, on loan, uh, you know, quick loan stuff. It is, it's appalling. Um, and the influence that that has, that that becomes almost like normal, um, it, it, it is wrong. And, and, and yeah, we, we should have a voice that speaks out. Um, uh, I'm very conscious also that at a, even just at a church level, um, that I would see parishioners who would favor particular things, uh, practices that go on uh, each and every day of our, our, our world. And, and I, I'm not blaming them. I'm just, I'm, I'm just concerned about the influences that can, that can just so deceit, de deceptively creep in. So, um, well, look, thank you. I was going to say there was a my favourite advert at the moment is the one, and it's probably nothing to do with what you were talking about. It's just, but there, there could be analogies drawn. To it. It's just it's an animated one where you don't know what the product is until later on about the mother coming down with the Christmas decorations and the son with the hoodie at the computer, and the mum goes decorations. The son's chest, probably his heart, is going. And his face is going back on the machine. And there's all these little scenes where he goes, and of course he goes to McDonald's. And then he's coming out, uh, his mum throws a snowball at him, and his little hearty face goes, and then his ordinary face goes, yeah, and starts throwing. So uh, uh, quite, but it also means that uh, I think that there's sometimes we put on a face for people in certain situations, uh, but our, our true heart should all the time come through. But I thought it was quite funny and, uh, and, and sort of, Touching. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Um, could I ask we just as we finish, would you mind if we just pray as we finish? Thank you. Heavenly Father, how we love your word. How we just adore to be together and to be able to talk through the word that you have left for us. And we know that the greatest word of all is the living word, is your son. Your son who came and died and took away our sins. And we thank you for him. And we thank you also that you have made it possible for us to be rooted in him. And for us to know that in him, we have the power to live our lives in a way that would please you. With the hope of a future in heaven with you. So I thank you now, Father God, for this time. I thank you for the preparation that Johnny has put into this and for the video, Lord, that just helps lead us all into it. And now as we go our separate ways, I pray that you will bless us and write these words of yours deep in our hearts that we may think about them and meditate on them in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, folks. Um, next week, we're going to continue where we've left off. So we're going to be doing uh, Colossians 2, and we're doing 16 through to 23. So 16 to the end of the, end of the, 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 the chapter.
Okay, so uh, have a have a great day, and uh, uh, see you see you soon. All right, and sure, sorry, right. Craig, you're not you're not see us physically in church. Oh, uh, of course, we'll, we'll be moving we'll be moving online. All right, take care. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.